Hello, I'm Lisa Thompson, the State Board of Equalization's Taxpayers' Rights Advocate. Taxpayers and stakeholders are invited to this year's Taxpayers' Bill of Rights hearing before the elected members of the State Board of Equalization on Tuesday, August 27, 2024, at 10 a.m. You can participate in person, by phone, or submit written comments before the hearing. We welcome comments, suggestions, or concerns about California's property tax system, the annual report, and the alcoholic beverage tax program. For more information, please visit www.boe.ca.gov forward slash TRA. We look forward to your participation. Ms. Chetty, please call the roll. Good morning. Uh, Chair Lieber? Here. Vice Chair Gaines? Here. Member Vasquez? Present. Member Schaefer? Present. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Deputy Controller Emron? Here. Mr. Schaefer is appearing remotely. I have a statement and a question when a member of the board appears remotely. If a member of the board attends the meeting by teleconference from a remote location, the member shall disclose whether any other individuals 18 years of age or older are present in the room at the remote location with the member and the general nature of the member's relationship with any such individual. Therefore, Mr. Schaefer, is there anyone yes. 18 years of age or older in the room at your remote location? If yes, please state the relationship of such individual. There is one person present and it is my chief of staff. Thank you. Thank you. Um, member Sikorum is present and the board meeting is called to order. And we will begin with our Pledge of Allegiance led by Ms. Vasquez. To the flag, to the republic for which it stands, nation under God, indivisible, with the injustice. Go now to um, members' opening uh, remarks. Does anyone have brief to share? Go to our vice chair, uh, Mr. Gaines, first. Yes. Opportunity. I just wanted to recognize a couple of events that uh, have occurred. Um, first, being the passing of uh, Congresswoman Sheila Jack Lee. Just wanted to acknowledge her passing and uh, the things that she did in the course of her life. She was a longtime U.S. Representative, state of Texas, lost battle with bad cancer on July 20th, age 74. Jackson Lee was a fierce advocate for women and minorities and a leader on many issues, from policing reform to reparations for descendants of slave people. He led the first rewrite of the Violence Against Women Act in nearly a decade, which included protections for Native American gender immigrant women. Jackson Lee was also among the lead lawmakers behind the effort 2021 to Juneteenth recognized as the first new holiday <coughs> since Martin Luther King Jr. Day was established in 86. She leaves behind a legacy of public service and dedication to the people of Texas. She was a woman of faith, surely be missed all who knew and loved her. Secondly, I just wanted to speak in reference to the assassination attempt for former Trump. Thanking God that he was not assassinated. But it really kind of raised the ugly head of incompetence in terms of affecting 
presidential candidates. We just heard today that okay. resigned. And um, it was an interesting congressional hearing. You heard anger and frustration on a Bible. We cannot protect candidates. We've we've got some real problems in this country. So um, I think this is a great opportunity to examine how they're functioning operationally and ensure that there's accountability, there are proper resources. All can. So, um, I just wanted to recognize that as a, as an event, uh, an opportunity to work by person based, solving one of the many challenges that we have in our country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I would also like to chime in, and, and uh, I'm glad the Vice Chair brought up the Honorable Jackson Lee. <clears throat> He's going to be sorely missed, and thank you for raising some of those points. He was a very active, not only elected official, but also very involved just on a national level. <clears throat> I, I was wanted to bring your attention also to uh, in our case, on the legislative side with our Latino caucus, we were we were just hit the decade on um, celebrating the fortunate that we're able to raise money to give out scholarships to these youth. And uh, this year, we hit a record number. We were able to put together just under uh, a half a million dollars for young. Uh, elected or not elected, but uh, young scholars throughout the state of California. And in the past, the awards were usually like the amount of five thousand. This year, we were able to break it. Uh, all these individuals are receiving a six thousand five hundred dollars scholarship. So, you know, with cost tuition these days, it helps a little bit right, for these young individuals that are moving on with their education. So we're real happy that, that we were able to do that. And in uh, the LA area, in my district, we have several young folk, women and men that uh, qualify and are gonna be recipients of the scholarship. The other issue I wanted to bring up is that uh, this is recognized Park and Recreation uh, Month. They trying to promote, you know, building strong communities, not only mentally, but also physically. And I think it's so important, given these times, that realize how stressful some of these folks are, especially as they come up. And we forget that, you know, we need to remind young men and women that take care of their body as well. So I wanted to bring that to your attention. And, <clears throat> and then the last thing I wanted to just mention is the whole issue of, on a national level, uh, this is, they're talking about the importance of, um, the theme, I guess, that I'm hearing is where you belong to celebrate the many ways park and recreation agencies foster a sense of belonging. And so often uh, we forget about that on a national level, and there's some real good programs going on throughout, not only in California, but throughout the country. And I just wanted to highlight and recognize those organizations, both nonprofit and city run programs that exist that are doing such a great job with our youth. Thank you, ma'am. And Mr. Emron. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and good morning uh, to all my colleagues. Uh, good morning to the executive director and members of the agency. I'm really, really happy to be kicking off uh, the July meeting in this beautiful, beautiful building here in Sacramento. So to members of the public and, and to my colleagues here too, I wanted to um, give you an update on an exciting initiative. Uh, in California State Control, Malia Cohen and I were thrilled to sponsor an initiative and subsequently became legislation. It was recently signed into law 
It's AB 2927, and this will require California high school students to provide a once semester standalone course in personal financial literacy courses as a graduation requirement from improving credit scores to reducing default rates, opening retirement accounts, supporting ensuring future generations of Californians understand how to save without saddling themselves in debt. Real life education is coming to the California classroom because we all know it's so easy to spend money and it's so hard to save it. And a recent report found that students taking personal financial courses in their youth can save more than $100,000 over their lifetime. This personal financial literacy requirement will begin at the start of the 2027 school year and making a one semester mandatory for the graduating class of 2031. Um, so as a former school teacher, I'm also excited for this very, very essential curriculum. I want to thank the governor, the legislators, and all the partners that were involved in this process um, in ensuring that the students of California have a future um, that's based in financial literacy. And then also, too, I just want to close out uh, the Paris Olympics are coming up uh, here in a few weeks. And I just want to wish all the hardworking athletes, I know it's a lot of sacrifice and dedication, blood and sweat and tears uh, as you go to Paris and you represent your country at the highest, highest uh, stage and at the world level. Um, and I just want to wish you all the best, best of luck. And also my colleague, Wendy Scott, will also be in Paris supporting those statesmen as well. So bring home the gold and uh, let's go USA. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Schaefer. Let me get the mic here. Uh, thank you very much. I want to tell you, uh, Madam Chair, how nice the room looks. Um, I'm looking at it from San Diego. <laughs> uh, I want to tell you that uh, I, uh, had a dinner with some people that one of them was infected with COVID and that put me on a, a sort of a quarantine for five days. Uh, no airports, no airport bombs. That's why I'm not with you today, but my heart is there. Um, I always have a birthday to share or so. Today we have Don Drysdale from the LA Dodgers who would be 88 if he's with us. And uh, if any of you are old enough to remember Pee Wee Reese, uh, he would be 106. He was a big name when I was growing up. And Daniel Red. Radcliffe, who we know as Harry Potter, is 35 today. More importantly, I want to celebrate an event that took place in my District 4 down in San Diego this last week. It's the 55th anniversary of the Apollo 11 mission. And would you believe that we had the astronaut who walked on the face of the Earth with us for dinner? Uh, we, had, uh, we had the astronaut, uh, Buzz Aldrin, who is 94 years of age. He's a Live and well, he got married uh, just last year, would you believe, to a lady that was a longtime associate of his after his wife had passed. Uh, here's a picture I'll share with you of uh, him walking on the face of the moon. You all remember that uh, picture. Uh, and I sort of felt like I had met Christopher Columbus because I did wave at him and he waved back at me as I exited uh, by his table. Uh, I'm sorry I'm not with you all today. I look forward to seeing you next month. And uh, I'm all excited that we're in our new home and I'm excited to be part of the family. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schaefer. We really appreciate that. And we are missing you here today, but we will see you in person next month and uh, are appreciative that you're able to uh, participate by video. So thank you so much. And I just wanted to um, say how much I appreciate our. Executive Officer Yvette Stowers and all of our board proceeding staff and other staff who have worked so hard on the transition uh, to a new space. It uh, really is a gorgeous facility that is fully state of the art. And I hope that all of us have constituents who will uh, have an occasion uh, to be here in Sacramento and, and stop by the, uh, the Maylee uh, State Office Complex. And I think it's really uniquely Californian that this complex is named for uh, Ms. Maylee, a woman who overcame a lot and gave long, long service to the state of California. She was a true Californian through and through. And so it's very significant that we're having the, the first meeting here today. So thank you. And we'll go on now to our uh, first order of business is our informational um, announcement from Ms. Chiquetti. Good morning. Our first uh, order of business is our safety and informational announcement. 
Uh, before we move forward, I was just going to, we're having maybe a little bit of technical issues right here. If, if the board members can move the microphone a little bit closer to themselves when we begin, uh, if you can, that'd be great. Welcome to the Maylee State Office Complex. A brief word about building safety. In the auditorium, the exits are located in the front of each side of the stage, and other exits are located at the rear of the auditorium. Please take a moment to locate the exit closest to you in the event of an emergency. Now our informational announcement. <clears throat> this meeting is live streamed to the public and posted on our BOE YouTube channel. Therefore, we ask that all speakers please state your name first before you begin speaking for the record. We ask that you speak clearly and slowly into the microphone. I would like to remind the audience to silence your cell phones and any other wireless device. The public comment is taken on each agenda item. The public will be invited to comment on matters before the board. If there are any members of the public wishing to speak before the board on any agenda item in person, we ask that you complete and submit to the Sergeant of Arms a public comment appearance sheet located at the entrance of the auditorium. If you wish to speak before the board by telephone, please dial the phone number and access code provided on the public agenda notice and follow the instructions of the AT&T moderator. If you intend to make a public comment today, use Demonstrated the, the ability to do any audits, and she hasn't done it uh, for 10 years plus. And so, but she's an expert. Let's hold on in, one second. In slay and risk assessment. Ms. Cohen, I think she's pretty Ms. Cohen can you mute your community. mic? Even, even though, uh, okay. Good morning. Can you hear me? We could hear you. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you. Good morning. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me continue on the um, informational announcement and then we'll acknowledge um, Ms. Cohn, uh, Controller Cohen. Let's see where I was. If you wish to speak before the board by telephone, Please dial the phone number and access code provided on a public agenda notice and follow the instructions of the AT&T moderator. If you intend to make a public comment today using the AT&T moderator, we recommend dialing into the meeting on the teleconference line before the beginning of the agenda item you wish to comment on. We recommend this as the audio broadcast on our website experiences a one to three minute delay between the live stream and the live event. When giving public comments, please limit your remarks to three minutes. This concludes the informational announcement. And let me acknowledge Controller Cohn. Controller Cohn is appearing remotely. I have a statement and a question when a member of the board appears remotely. If a member of the board attends the meeting by teleconference from a remote location, the member shall disclose whether there are any other individuals 18 years of age or older are present in the room at the remote location with the member and the general nature of the member's relationship with such individuals. Therefore, control the tone. Is there anyone 18 years of age or older present in the room at your remote location? If yes, please state your relationship with such individuals. No, there is no one here. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Members will go on to item one. This is public comment on matters that are not on the agenda. Uh, persons who wish to address the Board of Equalization regarding items not on the agenda may do so under this item. Uh, please note that the board cannot act on items that are not on our agenda. However, the board can schedule issues raised by the public for consideration at future meetings. Uh, when giving your public comment, please limit your remarks to three minutes. Um, we do not have any comment cards from the auditorium, but we do have uh, a written comment. So I'll ask Mr. Ketty to go to that one now. That's correct. We've received a written comment on our information line. I'm going to read it. It comes from an email address, jenniferlibrarian at gmail.com. For general public comment, I am a San Franciscan, born and raised, and I have been grateful for Prop 19, which permits homeowners like myself who are over age 55 
severely disabled, or whose homes were destroyed by wildfire or disaster to transfer their primary residence property tax base value to a replacement residence of any value anywhere in the state. However, I would like the board to know that the filing time in San Francisco to transfer the property tax base value to a new home is extremely long, which puts those lower income in a financial hardship for many tax cycles with a very high property tax bill. This delay is putting taxpayers in financial hardship because while we wait for our cases to be filed, we must pay the full taxes for property, which will be supposedly reimbursed later. It's important for taxpayers to know that the filing time is punitively long in San Francisco and that Prop 19 does not fully live up to its promise in the current time frame. The San Francisco Assessor's Office will simply tell you to be patient. For those counting on Prop 19 relief, this is not fair, this is not a fair answer and not a fair situation. Thank you. That concludes the public comment. Thank you. Uh, so we'll go now to our AT&T moderator. Uh, moderator, would you please let us know if there's anyone online who'd make, like to make a public comment regarding this item on the agenda, item one. If you would like to make a public comment, please press one then zero at this time. You may remove yourself from queue at any time by repeating the one then zero command. If you're on a speakerphone, please pick up the handset before pressing the number. Once again, to provide a public comment, please press one then zero. And we have no comments at this time. Thank you, moderator. And hearing no comments, we will uh, move on to our next item. Uh, the next item is item two, uh, fiscal year 2024 to 2025 private railroad car tax rate. And this is a constitutional function. Um, the presentation will be by Mr. McCool. Your microphone might not be fully on. Good morning, Chair Lieber and honorable members of the board. My name is Jack McCool, Chief of the State Assessed Properties Division. I'm here today to report on this year's private railroad car tax. This year's rate is 1.153%, which is up slightly from last year's 1.149%. The rate is computed annually by the board's Research and Statistics Division under the provisions of Revenue and Taxation Code Section 11403. This code section states that the board should annually compute the average rate of general property taxation in the state. The rate is calculated annually using data from the state controller's office and is approved by the BOE's executive director and reported to the board at the July board meeting for informational purposes. The approved tax rate is applied by the state assessed properties division to the annual private railroad car assessed value. The private railroad car assessed values multiplied by this approved rate will equate to the amount of tax due for each private railroad car assessee. This item is for informational purposes only and does not require any board action. That concludes the report on the 2024 private railroad car tax. Thank you. Thank you. Members, are, are there any questions, uh, Mr. McCool, Mr. Gaines? Yeah, I just wanted to clarify uh, in your summary, thank you for providing uh, what the rate has been in prior years um, because it's consistent with actually what we're reporting this year. Uh, last year was a little lower at 1.149, but the year prior was 1.155. For that, 1.156, the year prior to that, 1.154. So. It's real helpful to have that data so kind of where we are. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Vasquez, any comments? Questions? No, I'm good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Schaefer, did you have any comments or questions? I think 
You're unmute muted. yourself. Unmute it. You might need to unmute if you have any. Okay. Uh, Controller Cohen, did you have any questions or comments? Yes, of course I have questions. This is one of the, my highlights of the year. Thank you, Mr. McCool, to you and your team. Hello and good morning, BOE staff. Uh, and family, I do have a quick question just about the adoption of the uh, the private railroad car. First question is Los Angeles actually appears to be by far one of the highest level of net taxable access um, values as well as the highest amount of taxable levies. Can you tell me to what to what reason is this attributed? Well, without having direct knowledge, I think my answer would just simply be the amount of parcels that are taxable within Los Angeles County, just the sheer size, the accessible, uh, the sheer size of the number of parcels would directly equate to larger um, assessed value. Okay, so they're just, just um, physically larger, therefore correct. more to assess. Correct. Okay. All right. So then um, could you describe to me what a uh, non-total property lev levies are? I don't, I don't recall. Yes, yeah, so the non-total taxable levies are what are also referred to um, as special taxes. So those do include um, aircraft, bailed cotton, hospitals, flood districts, oh. et cetera. Okay, so are they attribut uh, attributable to special district uh, voter approved tax levies such as intangible, um, are there aircrafts? Uh, um, you state that they're so attributive, attributable to uh, bailed cotton. So does that mainly apply to just rural areas? So I'm sure the bailed cotton probably does, yes. Um, but all of those <laughs> are just statutory provisions that the local assessor's mm -hmm. offices are required for assessment purposes. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate the... Um, the clarification, and then I also just want to compliment the entire BOE staff. I love your new digs. It looks great. Look forward to meeting with you all in person soon. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. Any further questions, Mr. Vasquez? Just a quick point. I guess, you know, Mr. McCall kind of touched on it, but people forget that LA County alone is 10 million people. You know, unlike other counties throughout the state, you know, we're larger than most countries. Uh, so that's why I think you see such a high number here. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Anything further, Mr. McCall? That's fine. Okay, thank you. And again, members, this is just for informational purposes. Uh, so we'll go ahead and uh, roll, not to make a bad pun, uh, into item three, which is uh, adoption of the 2024 private railroad car tax roll. And this is also a constitutional uh, function, and it will be presented by Ms. DeNapoli and Mr. Ibarra. Thank you. Oh, a little further down, maybe. Oh, and also check if it's on. There. Good. Yep. Check, check. <laughs> so good morning, Chair Lieber and honorable members of the board. My name is Pamela DeNapoli. I'm a manager in the status of Properties Division. With me today is Mr. Jason Ibera. He's a supervisor of our real property appraisal and board role production unit. We are here today for your consideration and to present the adoption of the 2024 private rail car assessment. Before you is a report entitled 2024 recommendation for assessment of private. This report represents staff's recommendation for the lean date 2024 assessment of private railroad cars under the provisions of the private railroad car tax law. This year's total recommended assessed value is approximately 885 million. This is slightly lower than the previous 2023 private rail car assessment of approximately 899 million. The small difference from last year is primarily due to a slight decrease in demand for shipping versus 2023. This is not necessarily an indicator that it will continue to drop, but usually can fluctuate a little more, a little less than the previous. The total tax assessment um, difference is approximately 114,000. Upon adoption of the staff's recommendation, SAPD staff will prepare the 24 private railroad car tax bills and send them to the private railroad car taxpayers by the required statutory date of October 15th. 
the tax is due by December 10th, and the revenue from the private railroad car tax is deposited into, into the state's general tax fund. This is the only tax that BOE assesses, bills, and collects prior to depositing it into the general fund. So I ask for your adoption of the private railroad car. And Mr. Peterson and I are here and available if you have any. Thank you. Uh, members, are there any questions uh, on this item? Uh, Controller Cohen, any questions on this one? Mr. Schaefer, any questions? Okay, I'm not seeing any gestures there. Um, so, members, the suggested motion is to adopt 2024. Uh, private railroad car roll. Um, so moved. Mr. Vasquez moves. And um, let's see, uh, Mr. Gaines, would you like to second that? Uh, Mr. Gaines seconds. And we'll go ahead and go to public comment. We do not have any speaker cards from the auditorium. Young yeah, caller. Oh. Who's that? I'm not sure who that was. We're still adjusting to this auditorium, so it's a little bit choppy today. Apologies. Um, uh, we do not have any written comments uh, from the auditorium, so we'll go to our AT&T moderator. Um, moderator, would you please let us know if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment on this item? If you would like to make a public uh, comment on this item, please press one then zero at this time. Command again, one then zero. And we have no comment. Thank you, uh, moderator. Uh, members, any further discussion on this one? Seeing none, uh, Mr. Vasquez has uh, made the motion and Mr. Gans has seconded uh, that we adopt the 2024 private railroad car tax roll. And so we'll go to Mr. Ketty to call our roll here. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Controller Cohen? Aye. Thank you, members. Uh, the item carries unanimously. We'll go to item four, which is adoption of the 2024 state assessed property roll. And this is also a constitutional function and will be presented by Mr. Ibarra. Good morning, Chair Lieber and Arnold World Board members. <clears throat> I'm Jason Ibarra, Supervisor of the State Assessed Properties Division, Build Appraisal and Board Rule Support Unit. With me is Pam Ms. Pamela Dinopoli, Manager with the State Assessed Properties Division. We are here to present for your consideration and adoption 2024 State Assessed Property Roll. Before you is a report entitled the 2024 Recommendation for, state, for Assessment of State Assessed Property. This recommendation reflects the unitary values adopted by the board on May 29, 2024, along with adjustments to the role based on prior board act, as well as staff recommended non-unitary values. This year's state assessed role totals approximately 152 billion of assessed value. As additional information for the public audience, I want to highlight that the main difference between this item currently before the board and the board's adoption of the state assessed unitary values in May is that today's recommendation includes the allocation of the unitary values adopted in May to the appropriate counties in which the specific property is located. In other words, the board adopted total values for each state assessee in May, and today I'm requesting the board approve how those values are allocated to the state's 58 counties. Our staff relies primarily on assessee reporting as the basis for our allocation of the adopted assessed values to each county. Upon adoption of these recommendations, SAPD staff will transmit the allocated assessments to the 58 counties so that the counties may generate tax bills and collect property tax. Staff will provide each county auditor's office with an electronic version of the roll, and the electronic copy will be followed by a hard copy sent via U.S. mail. An electronic version is also transmitted to each county assessor's office as well. Each state assessee receives notice of their allocation, allocated unitary assessment, as well as their approved non-unitary value. Each notice provides information regarding how to file an appeal if they wish to do so, and provides the deadline dates to file an appeal. 
Members, that concludes our presentation of this item. I ask for your adoption of the rule, and Ms. Dinopoli and I are available if you have any questions. Thank you so much. Uh, questions, Mr. Vasquez? Just a quick one. Thank you uh, for your presentation. I was just wondering if you could possibly just go over uh, what, what happened here in terms of the increase I noticed on gas, electric, and water. It's, it jumped uh, almost 7%. I think it was 6.97% increase. Yeah, in that industry, we have a lot of um, old depreciated uh, items um, being replaced by new items. And so the assessed value for those new items is obviously, you know, um, greater than the old uh, items that are being replaced. Um, in addition, uh, those um, industry um, companies are replacing uh, a lot of their items, trying to reduce the risk for wildfires um, with those new uh, new items. So um, that that's uh, the main reason for that increase in that industry. So with the old equipment, I guess uh, it gets amortized over the years, so it's obviously a lot less. And now it. You mentioned, I guess, the modernization of some of that equipment. Right. Thank you. Uh, controller, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> so on the 10% penalty in California gas gathering for the, quote, failure to file, end quote, did the company agree to this penalty? I'm going to let Mr. McCool answer that. Um, to answer your question, Chair Cohen, none of the assessees assessed a uh, penalty for late filing have necessarily agreed to the late penalty being imposed. That penalty is a okay. statutory penalty that SAPD must apply to the, to the current year's assessed value. Um, so any notable differences between any company assessment uh, recommendation from from that uh, given last, from, from last year, that were given last year? Did that make sense? Any notable differences from the company assessment recommendation that was given last year? Any? There are no notice, noticeable differences. That it is important to note that the values um, that are included today are simply allocated to the 58 counties. So these are the same assessed values that the board approved the value setting meeting in, in May. Um, there is mm -hmm. a general increase overall, and that follows a trend uh -oh. that we have seen over the last several years. Oh. Um, we okay, are. Can you guys can still hear me? You hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, got it. Thank you. Please, Mr. McCool, finish. Um, I... We have, we, you know, from each industry, we do see changes from year to year, and there's specific reasons for that. This year's recommended role does follow a trend that we have seen in the last several years of an overall increase to our assessment role. That um, time out. Mr. McCool, your sound keeps cutting in and out. So I actually can't even hear your response. And then it's also really muffled and low. Can you go, but you can hear me okay. Yes, we hear you very oh. clearly. Okay, Madam Chair, I can hear you. It just seems to be the microphone maybe at the podium. Let's try a little adjustment here. Okay. Let's see if that helps. Um, Chair Cohen, to answer, to answer your question, um, this year's role is following a general pattern of overall increases to assess value that we have seen the last several years. The magnitude of the increase this year was not quite as large as we have seen in the last few years. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Ibarra or, or Mr. McCool? Uh, Mr. Gaines. I, I don't know if you can answer this from the podium, but I'm just curious in terms of um, the El Dorado County values. It looks like they went up 14.5%. I don't know if you might recall why that um, that much of an increase, and if you can't answer it now, Mr. Gaines, I'm sorry, I'm really struggling to hear the audio. Oh, I'm sorry. I yeah, thank you. Much yeah, better. let me speak in the mic here better. Okay. There you go. 
Yeah, so I'm just looking at uh, El Dorado County values. Um, went from looks like <laughs> 703 million to 806 million, a 14.54 percent increase. And I don't know if you you have that detail or not, but if you do, great. If not, if you could let me know later. The lion's share of that increase would be attributed to the overall increase in value of the gas collection for the reasons outlined by Mr. Barr earlier. Oh, okay. Just simple. You know, it's a very large assessee with property that is, um, generally speaking, aged, that is being replaced with brand new property that um, you know, is worth more than the property that's being replaced. Right, and some of that is um, fire hardened. Correct. I know they've been doing a lot Correct. of that in my county, and yes, I'm sure they're doing it up and down the state. The El Dorado portion of the state assessed role is um, largely driven by that one large assessment. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, not seeing any. We'll. Um... Go ahead to our suggested motion is to adopt the 2024 state assessed property role. Uh, controller, would you like to make that motion? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept the staff recommendation. Thank you. And uh, do we have a second on that? Seconded second. Um, from uh, Mr. Vasquez. And uh, we'll go That's to. Sure. I see either one. I, okay, either two, one. I, I saw the nod okay. come from that at first. Either. I'm watching you very closely. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we do not have any written comments on this item, nor any comment cards um, from the auditorium. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator. Moderator, would you please let us know if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment on item four? If you would like to make a public comment on item four, please press one then zero at this time. Command again is one then zero. And we have no comment. Okay, thank you, moderator. Um, members, if there's no further dis uh, discussion, we have a motion from uh, Controller Cohen, seconded by Mr. Vasquez. Uh, to adopt the 2024 state assessed property role. And we'll go to Ms. Chiquetti for our role. Aye. Vice Chair Gaines. Aye. Member Vasquez. Aye. Member Schaefer. I'm here. I didn't hey. hear you. Member Schaefer, your vote. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Controller Cohen. Aye. Okay, members, the item passes unanimously, and I appreciate everybody's patience as we iron out some of our first day wrinkles here. And we'll go on to item five, which is the Crown Castle Fiber LLC um, non appearance adju adjudicatory matter. Uh, this is also a, a constitutional function. And I'll note that contribution disclosure forms are required pursuant to Government Code Section 15626. Uh, board Proceedings has not received um, all contribution disclosure forms for this appeal from all parties, agents, and participants. Uh, so not all contribution disclosure forms were filed. Um, members noted that their records disclosed no contribution from these taxpayers, their agents, or are, or participants, and all parties, agents, and participants are on the, mem on the memorandum uh, that was provided to your office. Um, members must be mindful of the prohibition on ex parte communications for our adjudicatory matters with any violations of the prohibition being disclosed for the record. And we have with us Mr. Younger to make the presentation. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Lieber. And honorable members of the board. I'm Christian Younger, the appeals attorney for the State Board of Equalization assigned to this case. I have submitted a summary decision for Crown Castle Fiber LLC for consideration. In this case, petitioner has waived their appearance and is requesting the board decide this petition based on the written record. Petitioner has raised one issue in this petition, which was abatement of penalty. 
Based on the written record and reflected in greater detail within my summary decision, the petitioner has not met its burden of proof in this petition. Accordingly, I recommend that the board deny the petition. I ask for the board's adoption of the submitted findings of fact and recommended decision. This concludes the presentation, unless there are any questions. Thank you. Any questions, Mr. Vasquez? Thank you, Madam Chair. Just a quick question. You know, I understand that the main issue here is the abatement of the mandatory penalty under RTC 862, where the burden uh, is placed on the taxpayer to prove there was reasonable cause for the underreporting. Did the department, were they able to educate this uh, taxpayer uh, on the burden of proof requirement? Are you aware of that? Um. Due to the confidentiality of the record, I'm going to try and answer this on a high level, I guess. Uh, yes, the statute is pretty clear. Um, the petitioner filed their petition. SAPD filed, filed their response. No reply brief providing any. To prove otherwise, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Mr. Yeah. Gaines. Yeah, can, so you said they didn't uh, meet the threshold to satisfy the organization. So what, what would that threshold be? What would be the standard set? Um, the statute requires, places the burden on taxpayer um, to provide evidence to satisfy. Really, it's okay. And that was not forthcoming? Yeah. And the um, taxpayer filed a timely. So is it a 10% penalty? Yeah. And this is the result of escape assessment. So these are properties that were not reported. And has it been on, going on a long period of time? or um, The audit was for years I yeah so it's cumulative over that yeah this is escape assessment That's it. very good thank you thank you um mr schaefer or controller cohen did you have questions ms cohen i think you're still muted Sorry about that. We're still we're on item five, item five, right? Yes. Okay. So I know that this is a adjudicatory matter, so that we're really limited on what questions we can ask. So, Mr. McKeel, you can stand down. Um, but I do have one to, in terms of process. If we adopt the appeals attorney's recommendations to deny the petition, does the petitioner have any further avenue to appeal? I'm sorry, Ms. Cohen, can you uh, please repeat the question? Yeah, no problem. So this is related to item five, Crown, Cal uh, Crown Castle Fiber. And noting that I understand this is an adjudicatory matter, um, so I'm limited to the questions. I just want to know in terms of process, if we adopt the appeals attorney recommendation to deny the petition, what does the petitioner have and any other, uh, does there, are there any other further avenues that the petitioner can um, can exercise or explore in order for them to appeal? Well, this, this would be exhausting their administrative remedies. So um, they filed the petition. They had the opportunity for uh, an appeals conference, reply, uh, file reply briefs. So yeah, there were several steps where they could have taken, and then they could have requested oral hearing today, uh, okay. which, which the, the petitioner did not. Um, and in fact... And I note that we have Mr. Norm Scott approaching to give some additional advice. <laughs> Good morning, members. Uh, Norm Scott, uh, Acting Chief Counsel. Uh, Controller Cohen, to answer your question, yes. uh, if the board adopts the uh, recommendation of the appeals attorney, that will include the taxpayer's administrative appeal right. They do have further rights to pursue a refund of the taxes, but they would be required to pay those taxes, and then they could file suit in Superior Court alleging that under the statute they have met the threshold and are entitled to a refund, and that would be 
something that the court would decide. Oh, so there, so this is not the end all be all. There is, there is a remedy and a pathway forward. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much for that clarification. Great. Back, back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Um, Mr. Younger, anything else on that one? Nothing at no? this time. Thank okay. You. And I'm not seeing a, a hand up from Mr. Schaefer right now. Um, so, members, the suggested motion is to deny the petition of Crown Castle LLC for abatement of the penalties imposed under Section 862 for failure to report accurately. And uh, do we have a motion on so that? So moved. Uh, Mr. Vasquez and seconded by Mr. Gaines. And um, we'll go out to public comment on this, I guess, the right thing to do. Um, so we do not have written comments or comment cards from the auditorium. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator. Um, moderator, please let us know if there's anyone who would like to speak to item five on our agenda. If you would like to provide public comment for item five, please press one then zero at this time. We have no comment. Thank you. So um, members, we have a motion and a second from Mr. Gaines to deny the petition of Crown Castle LLC for abatement of the penalties imposed under Section 862 for failure to report accurately. And Ms. Chiquetti, if you would please uh, open the roll. All righty. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Controller Cohen? Aye. Hey, thank you, members. Uh, the, uh, item I'd like case. to, can I just interrupt real quick here? We are having technical difficulties. Can I ask the board members if you could lift up the microphone and bring it closer to you or on the side? We believe these microphones are very, or not sensitive enough. <laughs> yes. Okay. If we can do that with your notes and stuff, yes. Okay. So this should be a little bit better. <laughs> Trying to make sure. It seems to amplify my coughs very, very well. <laughs> um, but I'd just like to close that item by saying that um, uh, the motion passes unanimously on item five. And we're prepared to uh, go on to item six. Um, and this is adoption of the June, 20, uh, June 25th, 2024. Uh, board meeting minutes. Um, are there any? Uh, Madam Chair, may I just jump in and just say thank you very much. I'm going to be signing off and Deputy Controller Haseeb Emron is going to be stepping on, stepping in my uh, absence. Thank you so much, uh, Controller. Absolutely. We know how valuable your time is and we appreciate you being yeah. here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Um, so, members, does anyone have a question or a comment about the, the minutes of June 25th? No? Seeing none? Um, okay. Well, uh, we can take a motion to approve these minutes. So moved. Uh, Mr. Emron moves. And seconded by Mr. Gaines. And we do not have comment cards in the auditorium or written comments on this. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator. Uh, moderator, would you please let us know if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment regarding the consent agenda item six? If you would like to make a public comment regarding consent agenda item six, please press one then zero at this time. I command again, one, then zero. And we have no comment. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll close the public comment, and we have a motion to approve the minutes from Mr. Emron, seconded by Mr. Gaines. Ms. Chiquetti, if you would please call the roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. 
Deputy Controller Emron. Aye. Okay. Um, let's see. I, I think we have enough time to complete the next item uh, before our break here. And uh, this is item seven uh, regarding two items of property tax legislation. These are both um, bills that we have heard before. AB 1879 by Mr. Gibson regarding electronic signatures and AB 1868 by Ms. Friedman uh, regarding property taxation assessments and affordable housing, specifically the Habitat for Humanity um, model. And the update that I would have for you is that uh, Mr. Gibson's bill uh, was passed by Senate Rev and Tax 7 to 0 and uh, was passed on to appropriations with a consent agenda uh, recommendation. And um, Ms. Friedman's bill is uh, currently on suspense in Senate appropriations. And are there any questions or comments? About these, you know that we have talked about the substance of the bills a couple times, Mr. Emron. Uh, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. I did have a quick, quick question about this: um, the fee authorization for assessors to accept the, the e signatures. So, is there going to be a fee on top of the signature that's going to be required when it comes to electronic signatures? And I see Mr. Ted Angelo motioning as well as. <laughs> Mr. Young. Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Lieber, honorable members of the board. My name is David Young for the record, and I'm the deputy director of the property tax department. So thank you for that question, Deputy Controller Emron. Um, it is a permissive um, language in that in that proposal. It allows the assessors to basically recover a fee in which to enable and to manage accepting that type of electronic signature. It's not mandatory, but it does allow them to do so if there is, um, if, if they feel the need to do so. So it is permissive. So is there a sunset fee in the, in the, in the bill's language? Is there a, a sunset date on the fees? Or is this something that's permanent that you can charge a fee at any time when you're accepting electronic signatures? Well, it's usually when you file a form, there's usually a, a fee associated with it, whether it's through a digital signature, such as uh, one of the many e-signature, I mean, digital signatures out there. Sometimes there, there are fees embedded in there. This one, what this legislation does, it's, it allows them to do a different form of signature with their with their proposed method and our review and, and approval, they can go ahead and accept it. That is not strictly digital, but electronic. And there is still, they still may have processing fees in order to do so. It just allows them the opportunity to, to basically recoup some of those fees. It's, my understanding is that it is, it is at the option of the county that, 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 uh, that offers that type of service. So my understanding is, is yes or no? Is there is there a possibility of double fee? Uh, for example, DocuSign charges the fee for the electronic signature, and then the county also charges additional fee for accepting the signature. Typically, on 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 a particular form, it will be either it will be either through DocuSign or it will be either through the provisions that will be enabled by this bill. So typically, there would there should not be a double fee. Either if you have DocuSign. That, that qualifies fully as a digital signature, and you probably will not need electronic signature. And then the vice versa is also true. Some counties have a hard time paying for, doc, like you said, a, a service like DocuSign, and they may opt to go ahead and get and use an electronic signature, and if, especially if they find out that it's actually lower in cost for them to implement. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. So do we have an idea of which counties may or may not be assessing that fee as some smaller counties? Well, as of right now, there's 58 counties in the state, and they all have different levels of resources. Most of the major, bigger counties already have digital signature 
basically enabled and fully functioning. Uh, LA, for instance, they have the capability to accept digital signatures. I don't know how much that would help them if this, pass, if this bill passes, the electronic signature, they may not need it. They may find that it's cheaper for them to go ahead and use an electronic signature and opt to switch. That is a possibility. But mostly, it's the smaller and the mid-sized counties that have not adopted digi full digital signature. This gives them the option to do so in an electronic form, hopefully a little lower. If, you, if I had to make a good guess, I think most of the counties already have some form. It's the, it's the small and mid-sized counties that probably will benefit the most out of this. And their ability to recoup some of the costs associated with, with it may actually help them offer that electronic signature option to, the, to taxpayers and property owners. So let me ask you this question. This will be my final question. How can we as a board of equalization help these counties in terms of their, their application in the, the, when they submit this electronic? Is there a universal form that we can create that can help our counties? That's, take on rather than, for example, Shasta County has their own form right. and MODOC has their own form. If we, Board of Equalization as a state agent, create our own universal form for all state county assessors to use, we that, can help in that processing? Absolutely. That's a fantastic question. And I, I welcome the opportunity to answer that. The board prescribes and actually makes available over 100 forms digitally in electronic format already. We've been doing it for probably about at least two decades. We work in conjunction with the California Assessors Association, and we are actually a founding member of their e-form. We are a full member of that. We actually pay dues to it. We take these forms. We, we update them annually. When new legislation passes and new forms are required, we actually create them, and we send it to them for their use. So it's a jumping off point. They don't have to start it from scratch. We offer that, we do it on an annual basis, and many of their beginning of the year, we actually bring forms for you to adopt. And once with your adoption, what we usually do is we convert it into a digital format and we give them a starting point. I'm gonna have one more follow-up question if I can, <laughs> okay. Madam Chair. One more follow-up, this is a good conversation. Yes. <laughs> I'm learning a lot in this process. So with those filing, the, with the adoption, right? When you have the application submitted, right. these counties is optional to adopt board of equalization. It's just more of a recommendation. Is there any way we can streamline the process? For example, if somebody's going to submit these signatures in uh, two different counties, they have to fill out two different entire entire forms, and that board quite a while. So, is there any way that the board of equalization can streamline that process where they can go on the board website or the board? Is working with the county assessors, the CAA, if needed, and they can fill out one form, and you can almost click which county you can submit it. If that makes sense. Yes, it does. <laughs> so, especially if we're going digital, right? <laughs> yes, we're we <laughs> are already. So the forms that 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 is stopped, that our board adopted and board prescribed, they're a standard form. They only come in one format. There's a little spot for each county to put their own logo and their own information on that. So that is standardized. So if you're looking at the county and as part of that e-form uh, project, there is a specific function out of there that allows counties to basically accept a standardized form for business property statements. It is, it, it's, it's called ESDR, Standard Data Reports. What it is, it's basically if, somebody, if a taxpayer in California has multiple locations across the county, just pick a name, Target, for instance. They file many of these property statements. If they, if they are, if they elect, they can file on that platform and file it in one place. The counties actually take it and distribute it amongst the, amongst the people that subscribe to that service. So part of it is already available. I think the grand plan for the rest of the, for the state is to get more and more folks onto that type of platform. But like everything else, <laughs> we're talking about resources and money. It, it, is, it is part of the grand plan. It is in the works. Uh, we have a good start, but it is quite all the way done yet. Understood. So when it, 
not quite all the way done yeah. in order to this grand plan. Do we need more legislation in the next cycle to address the matter specifically? I, I think legislation and budget are always, <laughs> are, are always a good thing and needed. Thank you. And, uh, a follow-up question. It's my understanding that counties are only able to charge what represents their true costs. Correct. That, so that, is, that is the intent. And, and um, uh, taxpayers can still file the, the old-fashioned way and not pay that very small additional charge. You, you are absolutely correct. It is, it is not instead of, it isn't in addition to. It just gives the taxpayer multiple options. They, yeah. they can always file it by mail. Hard. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Uh, Mr. Vasquez. Thank you, Madam Chair, first of all, for bringing these bills back for our consideration today. And if I'm hearing you correctly, especially with the comments that uh, Deputy Controller just raised, is it, am I correct to, because I was going to ask for an amendment, but is it correct to assume that it's in this uh, bill, AB 1879, which would allow possibly a, the BOE, an agent, to authorize this form. You mentioned we have several forms already that could be used. Yes, so, so this bill actually does a thing. This bill will make it basically permissive for those counties that offer our forms, our board prescribes form on their website and they're able to submit it. It requires, once if they do that, it requires them to take an electronic signature. So not all counties have that ability to submit the form electronically. So if you do have it, then once you are able to, let's say you have a business property statement, it's a 571L, you can fill out all the agenda, all the schedules, you can send it in electronically. If you, if you do that, it requires you to also be able to send in the electronic signature fully authorized. So we so this bill will cover all of that. The uh, the the other couple there are a couple other things this bill actually does. One of them is that it also expands the mode in which you can file something basically through the U.S. Postal Service. So you can actually file both in by regular hard copy mail. And then the third thing it does is that it does give the counties Option to charge basically a small, a nominal fee in order to recoup some of their costs. Without the ability to, to, to charge those fees, some of the smaller counties may not be able to offer that service because they will not be able to absorb it. So, overall, I believe the bill should address multiple issues and give the, and it, it leaves it at the county's option. Um, and I think Mr. Angelo has something to add on to this. Mr. Emma. So it's on the chair, but Dave, when you, Mr. Young, when you're bringing up these points, right, and these smaller counties are not able to take on some, some costs and they have to charge some fees, so in your recommendation, where does the Board of Equalization play a role in this? As a state agency, we have the resources, we oversee these counties, and how can we help now with these counties transitioning to e-signatures? My understanding, too, is that, <laughs> my understanding, too, is that it's not a requirement for these e signatures in a lot of the counties, smaller counties, because of all the costs, it may, it may shy them away where they're saying that, you know what, we're going to stick to the, the old way of doing things. You have to have a wet signature. You have to fill out all these documents. And if I go from one county to another, especially in a rural county, that I have to fill out two separate forms, which takes a lot of time, processing time, and then on top of all the fees associated with those costs, too. You've asked our executive um Deputy Controller, for that excellent question. Um, we all acknowledge that some of our 20s, <laughs> new facility, <laughs> we all recognize that some of our counties do not have the resources to offer electronic filing or electronic signatures. We stand in support with them. We, are, we actually sent out a letter to the Board of Supervisors asking them to support our county assessors and their budgets. We are, as Mr. Young said, we are part of the e-signature platform. 
we are a member of that. We pay a lot. <laughs> we just renewed the contract. So we are there standing with our assessors for electronic filing. I mean, a lot of money. I was surprised how much we pay. <laughs> and we do, as Mr. Young said, um, subscribe the forms. We give them the forms in a paper format and electronic format. And we allow the counties to decide on how they want to offer those forms to their constituents, to their taxpayers. We cannot force them. However, if there was legislation that mandated to have electronic filing and electronic signatures, that would be a state mandate. And the counties would have to follow suit and have electronic filing and electronic signatures. But with a state mandate, they would be entitled to reimbursement because it would be a mandate. As this legislation stands right now, which is authored by the California Assessors Association, no, Arthur, sponsored by the CAA, they see this as a path forward to having electronic signatures and electronic files. Yes, there are going to be a few counties who decide not to offer electronic filings or electronic signatures. We cannot force them to do it. We can only make it fail and highly encourage them. And unfortunately, the CEA president is not available to speak on this matter, but I have talked to her repeatedly, and they stand with the legislation as well. Understood. Thank you. Thank you for, for making that clear. You know, when Mr. Young was making his presentation, he's like, these counties have their forms, they put their own logos on it, but my, my proposition is, is the Board of Equalization make a universal streamline with our logo that helps these counties process these e-signatures. I mean, we're in 2024 now, and a lot of these documentation are well over hundreds of pages, so I think just in the process of streamlining and making it uh, e-receipts and e-signatures, I think there's some space here for the Board of Equalization to step into this role and help Smaller well, county assessors. That, that's that's core, our core values and our core, core mission here. If I may step into the fray a little bit, I think since what we have agendized is this bill, <laughs> we have to keep it kind of to this bill. I saw Mr. Norm Scott start to make a little motion there. And um, it, it will be, a, you know, beginning in January, it's going to be a fresh legislative session. So there's going to be a, a clean page. and. And I think we could ask all those questions of um, the Assessors Association. I think that they do tend to be sort of individualistic and maybe not want a top-down approach um, because they feel that they know their county the best. Um, but we are going to be getting into a fresh uh, session then. And Mr. Angelo, did you want to get into the fray here? Mm -hmm. And I've got another question, oh, yeah. so we don't want... Everyone I'll try to, to synthesize. Away. I'll try to send Ted Angelo with the Legislative Research and Statistics Division uh, with BOE, and I, I'm going to try to synthesize some of the issues very quickly since they've been covered uh, pretty comprehensively already. But it really does offer an option, even though there is a mandate. If you do accept the forms by the counties, uh, to uh, it allows them to charge a reasonable fee. And I'm not an attorney, but the reasonableness standard uh, says they can only charge a fee equivalent to like the cost they would incur. And, it, and Mr. Emron's comment about uh, uh, coordinating forms and making it easier for the counties is well taken, but the cost that's incurred is for the verification of the e-signature, which is proprietary cost passed on by the companies that do that. So, so those counties that don't want to incur that cost or pass it through to the person filing the paperwork electronically as a reasonable fee associated with doing it that way can do it through the paper process. Those that don't accept a form electronically from us do not have to charge a fee or accept it. So there's, even though there's a mandate in the bill, and there's an option to defray the cost, it's, it's still optional at this point. Now, if there, if there wasn't a, a future concern about the costs of what it would be, 
going forward and what that would cost. And there's many other examples I could go into, and I won't belabor it, but there are other state entities that accept cards, credit card payments, and they were a loss to the general fund, and they were offset by a reasonable fee. And that fee is, can only cover the costs that the entity, the department, the agency uh, incurs in accepting that type of electronic payment, credit card, what. So I'll stop there. I just wanted to make it clear that, that the amendment that was put in uh, to, uh, to put a reasonable fee was at the request from my understanding of the CAA, California Assessors Association. So they are, in, they are the sponsors, as Ms. Stowers indicated. If there is a future need to do further looks into I think they would look. Okay. Anything further on that one? Uh, no further questions. Just want to thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and all my colleagues. I think it's something that we should definitely continue to explore um, in this day and age. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Gaines. Yeah, I want to thank Deputy Controller Emron for a really good question, very thorough and uh, very similar issues in terms of what's happening in my district also. Uh, but if I understand what Mr. Angelo was saying, is it sounds like you could use a pr proprietary product, DocuSign, for instance, and that cost could be passed on to the user. But the user would have the ability to decide whether to go pay for it no cost or pay a fee you know, very similar to dmv i renewed my registration i think it cost another 2.6 percent to put it on my visa and so i could have written a check for that um so i'm, I'm nodding i just want to say i agree with your assessment yeah yeah so thank you i um really appreciate uh, Assemblyman Mike Gibson for bringing this legislation forward because it's advancing our ability to provide better service to our constituents, and then we'll figure it out from there. There's still <laughs> things that, that some loose ends, and you bring up great points, and I really appreciate it, especially on the fee aspect, making sure there's reasonableness on the fee and it's associated with a particular service being provided. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I would note that uh, both of the bills have moved through the process with, I don't think, any no votes. Um, Mr. Gibson's measure got off the assembly floor 72 to 0, and uh, Ms. Friedman's bill um, got off the assembly floor 66 to 0. So a good level of, of support. And um, so if there are no further comments or questions, we'll. Um, I would appreciate a uh, support position on these two measures. And so I'm going to go ahead and take a little point of personal privilege and uh, move that we support AB's uh, 1868 by Ms. Friedman and AB 1879 by Mr. Gibson. And uh, Mr. Gaines seconds. And um, we will go to our public comment. We don't have any comment cards from the auditorium or written comments on this. We'll go to our at and moderator. Uh, moderator, would you please let us know if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment regarding item seven? If you would like to provide public comment regarding item seven, please press one and then zero at this time. That command again, one then zero. And we do have a comment coming through. One moment while we gather their name, please. And um, our comment is from Gina Rodriguez. Please go ahead. Thank you. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. Um, my name is Gina Rodriguez. I'm a principal at Ryan. And we are uh, one of the world's largest property tax firms and um, been spending a lot of time with the assessors on this bill and um, very much appreciative of uh, them moving toward each signature, although it is still permissive, not, not mandatory, and also very appreciative of Deputy State Controller uh, Emron's comments um, on there's so much more to do. We have 
so, so many processing issues with property tax. Again, 58 counties, they're all different. And uh, it's, it's been quite a whirl in the last two years just working on some of these issues. I, I really do miss the property tax committee at, at the Board of Equalization. Um, two things. Uh, when we file uh, our personal property tax returns for our clients, we do pay a, a fee currently to DocuSign. I think it's by signature. Um, so we are already paying a fee. Um, secondly, I know there's been discussion about B of E prescribed forms. As, as tax professionals, we prefer B of E prescribed forms because they allow us um, to go to one place and get that form. We're not searching for 58 different forms in 58 different counties and, and some of the counties rejecting the one we did, the ones we did choose. So I know that we already have a, currently a B of E prescribed form. For example, um, we have a, an authorization of agent, so it's an agent authorization form that the board prescribes for assessment appeals, which is wonderful. So the form is accepted by all 58 counties. Um, we are hoping that there would be an agent authorization form for, um, for filing. Again, we have to go to 58 different counties to, to file, to find the agent authorization form to actually file returns. And we do file many, many returns on paper because as was stated, the not all counties accept e-filing. Um, we actually have a rule 305 uh, that's currently on the books that addresses um, the agent authorization form for uh, assessment appeal applications. And interestingly, um, you know, it's very encouraging about uh, uh, encouraging the county to accept um, electronic signatures. And the rule even states that beginning January 1st, 2022, any county offering online filing of an application should provide a mechanism for an agency authorization form to be submitted electronically with the application. And I would note there, there is no fee to file that, um, to file that form online. Um, so again, I appreciate the fact that we're talking about statewide forms. We, um, we, we walk in because of the counties not having um, e-filing in just one day during our busy season, we will walk into the post office with 900 pounds of mail. And the, the U.S. Postal Service is overwhelmed. Time has expired. All that paper... Excuse yeah. me, I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Mm -hmm. Rodriguez. Yeah. Could you finish your Thank sentence? You. Thank you. Thank you so yes. much. All that, all that, mm -hmm. and we appreciate all that needs to be uh, addressed by the county. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate all your communications. And we'll bring it back to the board now. Um, if there are no, no further discussion on the item. Um, I have um, made a motion, and Mr. Gaines has seconded, that we adopt a position of support on uh, AB 1868 and AB 1879. And, uh, so uh, if you would please open the roll, Mr. Getty. Mm -hmm. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. Deputy Controller Emron. Aye. Okay, thank you, members. And for staff, if I might <coughs> um, make the request, if we can also um, send the support letter to Senator Probes on these, in addition to um, sending it to the member, that would be very helpful, uh, especially with Ms. <coughs> Friedman's bill that's um, going to be on suspense. So, um, we uh, have our 10 minute break that we're about 23 minutes over time to take. So we'll go ahead and take our 10 minute break now and let's reconvene at uh, 11.35, if we may. Thank you. Hello. I'm Lisa Thompson, the State Board of Equalization's Taxpayers' Rights Advocate. Taxpayers and stakeholders are invited to this year's Taxpayers' Bill of Rights hearing before the elected members of the State Board of Equalization on Tuesday, August 27, 2024, at 10 a.m. 
You can participate in person, by phone, or submit written comments before the hearing. We welcome comments, suggestions, or concerns about California's property tax system, the annual report, and the alcoholic beverage tax program. For more information, please visit www.boe.ca.gov forward slash TRA. We look forward to your participation.
I think we've got our sound back. Um, members, we had completed item seven, but my understanding is that there's a little bit more uh, staff comments and inputs that they wanted to make on uh, AB 1879, some clarifications on the Gibson bill. Um, so Mr. Young, did you have some comments? Yes, uh, thank you, Chair Lieber. Thank you for, again for the opportunity to address the board. So yes, uh, I just wanted to actually clarify that we, the board, as a part of our official function, we already prescribe and make readily available to all 58 county assessors the 100 plus forms that is used to administer the property tax system in, in the state of California. Almost all, they all get it, they all use it, and that is their launch point in which to basically model their forms, their forms. So if the board prescribes it, they have to use our board prescribed forms. The stuff that, the forms that we do not prescribe, they have the ability to develop a county developed forms. So there are some counties with very, very, special individual needs that they may want their own forms. So if they do that, they're, they're able to do that. The board reviews it, gives it the okay, but it is not a board prescribed. So, but the vast, vast majority of the forms out there are actually prescribed by the board. We actually update it, we actually create it, and we actually give it to them in both hard copy format and digital format, and we do this on an annual basis. I just wanted to make sure that, that, you've, that you understand how the interplay of the forms that administer the property tax system, how it works for the board, the county assessors, and how we do the whole cycle. So, okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. And I, I know that, I, I can't remember which month it was that we saw the item on the, right. on the forms. Yeah, I believe and, it was April. And there's a forms um, subcommittee that is constantly working correct, correct. on that. Correct. So we, we have our own uh, staff that's dedicated to that. The assessors have, through their organization, through their standards committee, they have basically a subcommittee. It's the form subcommittee. We meet twice a year. We collaborate on what needs to be updated, what new forms need to be created. And then we make it all happen. It, it, the changes come before the board, and then it's made available to all 58 counties. Okay. Okay, thank you for that additional information. Um, more to come on that, I'm thinking. And we're going to go on now to item eight, uh, which is under board member matters, the hydrogen hubs development and its property tax implications. <clears throat> this item is presented by member Vasquez. Thank you, uh, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members. Last month, I presented this topic of concern on hydrogen hubs, known as H2 hubs, on whether we have the resources and, and capacity to meet the possible property tax implications of this emerging technology. I present this item to you again to propose holding an H2 hubs informational hearing during our regularly scheduled uh, November 2024 board meeting in Sacramento. As I have outlined last month, along with my detailed memo to all of you, this is an emerging industry in the public utility arena. And it presents the BOE and our assessors with an opportunity to help meet the property tax challenges and questions that will need to be addressed. An informational hearing is necessary to start, and it will enable us to directly engage with a brand new set of stakeholders, experts, and interested parties who will be depending on the guidance and assistance. I want to emphasize that this is a new topic of concern that we do not have full grasp of yet, but want to acknowledge and be in the front of this to assist our stakeholders and provide guidance to our county assessors when they need it. 
I stress that the BOE has a clear nexus here as our primary cons constitutional function, the BOE assesses public utilities and other specified properties such as pipelines, fumes, canals, ditches, and aqueducts, as well as property owned or used by regulatory railroad, telegraph, and telephone companies, railroad car companies, and companies transmitting or selling gas, electricity, although this is purely governmental sponsored program and that has granted California $1.2 billion, private industry will commit an additional $11 billion to develop this technology to produce, transport, and store hydrogen energy. Additionally, the BOE oversees the assessment practices for 58 county assessors who are charged with valuing over 13 million assessment each year. Most likely both state and local assessment authorities and functions and the BOE guidance will be involved in the development and the build out of the H2 hubs, pipelines and other facilities. This is just the beginning and Although we may not know the exact details of this program, we can get started and anticipate the property tax implications that this technology will bring. We can invite representatives from the GOBIS, the California Energy Commission, Arches California Initiative to accelerate renewable hydrogen projects and the necessary infrastructure, state and local officials, experts from the industry, and other interested parties to discuss, and the eight issues listed below suggest in my memo, focusing on not limited to determining the property tax impacts of H2 hubs, whether further rulemaking is needed for the H2 hubs and other emerging renewable fuel and green industries, which emerging renewable fuel and green industries under current law should either be state or locally assessed, staff capacity, and if additional training is needed. And fifth here is the additional workload issues this industry may bring forward. Any pragmatic issues regarding the assessment of this industry, federal and state exemptions, <clears throat> et cetera. Ex estimated revenue and agency cost associated with the H2 hubs or related industries. And last but not least, the educational outreach, marketing campaigns for regional and local governments, county assessors, as well as various stakeholders. Again, my hope is that this informational hearing will provide us with a better understanding of the hydrogen hubs and hydrogen technology laws and regulations, as well as the property tax guidance rules, the novel impacts uh, applicable to hydrogen hubs and related industries. I would like to move this uh, in a form of motion after we have some discussion. Basically, we'd make the motion to approve this proposal for an informational hearing to be held in November uh, here up in Sacramento, if there's a consensus. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other questions and discussion, Mr. Emron? Uh, just want to thank you, Madam Chair. I want to thank uh, Member Vasquez for his leadership on, on such an important topic. Uh, the state of California has set some very, very rigid benchmarks when it comes to fueling out, phasing out diesel trucks. And when you think about hydrogen hubs, when it comes to our ports, all the commercial goods that come through that, uh, when you think of our buses, our, our future of our transportation, I think hydrogen hub stations plays a very, very important role. I was just actually noticing in San Bernardino, they just rolled out their first hydrogen fuel train like, that's gonna transport passengers. And I think back in San Francisco, where I hail from, there's the first hydrogen boat, uh, which offers actually six months free for people to try out to see how they like it. So I think it's very cutting edge. Just wanna applaud you and, and, the, and the members of this board for taking on such a such cutting edge. And, and when you think of innovation, California is the place of innovation. It's the innovative capital of the world and the hydrogen hub station is that future too. So looking forward to the discussions in the come, Member Vasquez and, and your leadership on this issue. Thank you. Thank you. 
And did staff have uh, input on the timing of some of the emerging issues relating to this? Eva Stowers, is executive director. Thank you, Chair Lieber. Thank you, Mr. Imran. Thank you, Mr. Vasquez, for bringing this item to our attention. This is emerging technology, and we should be studying it. Um, I know that we've been talking about, previously we were talking about an October start for the information hearing. I would like to recommend that we do your information hearing in, at the November meeting, the second day in November. Not the second day, but the second day of the board meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, and that would give you time for your staff to reach out to the various parties, including GoBiz. Um, I also have Mr. Young with me who could provide uh, an overview of this technology and how it has nexus to the work that we do and why we should definitely be at the table. Mr. Young? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dowers, and uh, thank you, Chair Lieber and honorable members of the board. Once again, David Young, Deputy Director of the Property Tax Department. I, too, am looking really forward to this informational hearing. There are many, many threshold questions that, that, uh, that I would like to be better informed on. I've already taken some steps. I've researched the hydrogen hub and, what's, and, and what their grand plan is, so I'm very excited that they're already committed initial funding to, uh, to, to do the, the ba basically the pilot study to see how it would be formulated in California. So there are a couple of things that um, I'm particularly looking forward to. One of them is there's basically a couple of really threshold questions that, that, that would be fantastic if they can provide a little, a little bit more information on. First of all is that there is a discussion of a private-public partnership, and I understand the structures of that usually, but depending on how and who what and how things are owned, there is the question of whether it's mostly state-owned, all state-owned, or very little state-owned. And if that is the case, it affects their incident of taxability. If it's state-owned, we, we can't tax the state for it. So it, depending on the structure of the partnership, that will, that will answer at least some of that first issue as to who owns it, how it's taxed. If it is mostly state-owned and private partners have enough interest in it, is there a taxable PI? We've already, we've already had that discussion earlier in, in some of the affordable housing issue. There are uh, JPAs, joint power authorities, so there may be some parallel here. And then, of course, the next issue is if it is taxable, is it a PI? who picks it up, whether it's locally assessed by the 58 county assessors or whether we do it ourselves as part of the utility role, basically. So there's a couple of things there that, that initially it would, it would be really, really good to, to get some uh, direction, some clarity on. And then the very last thing, as, as, as uh, Board Member Vasquez brought up, there's the whole issue of the actual assessment of that. How are we prepared? How are the counties prepared? What are resources that are available? It's going to be a big job. Typically, the assessment issue is broken up into four steps. You got the discovery of the property. Who's going to find out what's being built? You got the inventorying of that property. You got to figure out what's on the ground, when they put it in, what the costs are. Then you got the valuation part of it. You got to figure out what it's actually worth. And then at the, at the very end, it's the enrollment process. When you actually put it on a tax roll, whether it's ours, the counties, how does it get enrolled? Will there be any tax breaks that you've already brought up, whether it's federal, state, and whatnot? How does all that kind of play together? So it's, it's fantastic that we're grabbing this issue early on and trying to basically get a little bit ahead of the game. So I really look, do look forward to, to the informational hearing. So thank you. Thank you. And a question, do we know the locations of the, of the hubs yet? I, from from some, of the, some of the press releases, it sounds like at least one in the Southern California area and one in the Bay Area. And that, that's very preliminary. I believe that's going to be driven by a lot of things one where where the people are where 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 and then the other one is where actually some of the raw material that goes into 
making all this hydrogen where, where it's readily available. So I believe those are the two main areas they've talked about. So. Okay, so a lot of questions and taking it from the conceptual stage to yeah. something that will be more filled out. And I think we can develop some of that information in the hearing, bringing in different parties. So, okay, great. Any further questions uh, for Mr. Young? Okay, seeing none, um, uh, Ms. Dowers. Thank you, Mr. Young. I just wanted to um, be cl clarify that the information hearing, if this board decides to have it, um, I strongly support it. It should take place in November. <laughs> That's going to change another information hearing date, and I have received confirmation. Should the board decide to move forward with Mr. Gaines, Feister Gaines hearing, it would take place in October, and we are prepared, my staff and your staff are prepared to have that take place in October. But <laughs> as in all informational hearings, they are very similar to a board member work group. That means that it would be on to the member who is sponsoring the informational hearing to obtain the speakers. We will accommodate as much as we can with respect to our team's environment if they cannot be here in person. But the, the arrangement, the agenda is on that member who is sponsoring the event. Thank you so Great. much. Great, thank you. And um, any further discussion or we can uh, go out for our public comment. We do not have any written comments nor comment cards in the auditorium. So we'll go to our AT&T moderator. Uh, moderator, would you please let us know if there's anyone on the line who would like to make a public comment regarding item eight. If you would like to make a public comment regarding item eight, Please press one, then zero at this time. And we have no comments. Okay, thank you. So we'll bring it back for board discussion. If there is no further discussion, Mr. Gaines. Just if I could um, briefly state, I think this is a, a great endeavor um, <coughs> looking into the future and opportunities in terms of how we transport ourselves in the state. Uh, hydrogen seems like a real viable option. I know there's a lot of research that's been done by the auto industry. When I was in the legislature, I got an opportunity to drive in a seven series BMW that was actually, actually had modifications to its internal combustion motor. And uh, it was all hydrogen. It was really, really fascinating. So I'm. I'm hoping that this could serve as another option that people would have available in terms of transportation. And then, of course, we've got to figure out how to value it. And, I, I, and just putting in my, my opinion, I think it'd be best served to have this financed by the industry uh, versus the state. You know, maybe there's some incentives or something of that nature, but um, we've got enough on our plate in terms of our budget. So. Yeah, but I'm very excited about moving forward. Thank you. No, no, I appreciate it. And, and uh, you know, I had the, uh, the also the uh, luxury back when I was on the city council to drive, uh, not the BMW, though. Mine was a little Toyota. But it, it, was, it was pretty impressive. And I was surprised the power it had for you know, being a non-gas combustion engine. Uh, matter of fact, uh, in Santa Monica, it was, I think, one of the first hubs uh, that has one, and there was, uh, you probably know Mary Nichols, uh, who's real involved in this issue. She literally kicked off in Santa Monica and drove this Toyota from Santa Monica to San Francisco. Uh, and she was kind of sweating it because I think there's only one stop in the middle where you can, <laughs> at that point, this was, you know, almost 10 years ago, where you can uh, fuel up again. Because that's one of the issues, you know, is just providing more stations. We're starting to see more pop up, but I think the private sector is really stepping up. And I think you're right. At the end of the day, given our budget, I think the private sector is going to have to really come come to the table on this one. Yeah, great. Well, we have a, a motion from Mr. Vasquez, seconded by Mr. Gaines, to 
uh, schedule a hearing on hydrogen hubs development and its property tax Im implications to take place on the second day of our November meeting. And so, Ms. Chiquetti, if you would please call the roll. Chair Lieber? Aye. Vice Chair Gaines? Aye. Member Vasquez? Aye. Member Schaefer? Aye. And Deputy Controller Emron? Aye. Okay. And um, let's see. We're scheduled to take a lunch break at, at 12 o'clock. Um, uh, it's uh, two minutes to on our clock. So I, th I think we'll hold off uh, on the insurance item. I know that that one's going to go relatively quickly because it's a follow-on to our previous hearing, but um, we'll, we'll go ahead and take our break now. And we are going to take an hour and 15 minutes so that we can adjust to the options and um, do our necessary things that we do during our break. So we will uh, be back here at 1 p.m. Hello, I'm Lisa Thompson, the State Board of Equalization's Taxpayers' Rights Advocate. Taxpayers and stakeholders are invited to this year's Taxpayers' Bill of Rights hearing before the elected members of the State Board of Equalization on Tuesday, August 27, 2024 at 10 a.m. You can participate in person, by phone, or submit written comments before the hearing. We welcome comments, suggestions, or concerns about California's property tax system, the annual report, and the Alcoholic Beverage Tax Program. For more information, please visit www.boe.ca.gov forward slash TRA. We look forward to your participation.